Thank you, Professor Ivana Markovic is here, and I will give her the floor for the extremely important top co course and topics within the course of criminal law uh, considered or reconsidered from gender perspective. So, Ivana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone, also from my side. Um, here are a few of you. I know that the examination period is very, very near. Mm -hmm. And uh, 19 of you are online. I see you in front of me. So, um, welcome. I strongly encourage you to participate in this presentation because it's not meant to be I uh, fill you up with information on gender competent criminal law. On the contrary, it should be a dialogue, a conversation, a discussion on what is actually gender competent criminal law, what are the good sides and what are the downsides. Uh, please also be free to um, stop me at any time if you have a comment or a question. I know the structure of the presentation is meant to be that we have a short break after the first uh, two um, lessons and a workshop discussion at the end of the course. But also, as I've heard from Professor Vragica, uh, the dynamics were different insofar as there, were, there was basically discussion all, during all, um, all, of, um, all of the time. So please feel free to do the same also um, today um, when it comes to gender content criminal law and my presentation. Um, allow me to start with a typically legal introduction, namely um, with a disclaimer. Um, gender competent criminal law is not criminology. On criminology, my uh, colleague Nadia Lugic will talk, I think, on, on, on Thursday, on the 1st of June. So uh, this will be, um, let's say, um, the, the a finalizing of the picture of crime as such. But Gender competent criminal law is, um, something, is something different, and I will come to that back again. Also, uh, please pardon me uh, in advance, because this presentation, this lecture, is the cherry on the whipped cream of my ice cream sundae called a uh, full semester of criminal law teaching. So please bear with me until, until, uh, until the end. Now, um, gender competent criminal um, law. When you Google this, this term, you will not come up with many results. You will come, even when you come up with results and with papers on, on this issue, on this topic, you will see basically that the main issue or the main topic that was uh, in those papers is actually also something that comes closer to criminology than to, than to gender competent criminal law, which means that the context in which we regard these gender issues when it comes to gender competent criminal law is extremely important and sometimes or often even overshadows something that criminal law actually is. And what is criminal law as such? Uh, I guess all of you are, have finished um, law, the faculty of law, our or some, someone, um, some other faculty of law. And um, what can be said for literally all faculties is that criminal law that is taught there is usually very traditional. Uh, it's, I dare to say, rigid. It doesn't change very often. It's actually hard. It's an area that's hard to change. And I may also say that it's a conservative area of law. I know that criminal lawyers don't like to hear that, but it is how it is. And the reason for that is that the nature of the legal goods that are protected by it and the severity of the punishments, the most the harshest punishments a legal system knows are actually those of criminal, of criminal law. So there is some caution always present when we talk about criminal law, either when we prescribe some behavior as a criminal offense or if we prescribe sanctions for them. Um, in this, you see indirectly also one of the characters characteristics of criminal law and its, its subsidiarity. It always comes at the end. You do not take over or you do not react with criminal law in the first place, but you wait until the very end if it is actually necessary to use the means and instruments of criminal law. Thank you very much. So 
However, for reasons of illustration, I have added to this presentation today some elements that one usually would not find in an article of criminal law. So this is about gender competent criminal law, but um, with, with a twist, so to say. The issue of gender competent criminal law as such is very new. Again, not to confuse with criminology, where it has an established development so far. Then why do we talk about gender competent criminal law at all? Why is it so important? Even though the law as such in general enforces and justifies dominant relationships of power, criminal law mandates socially acceptable behavior in the most direct manner. It's either allowed or then we come to act, it's prohibited and sanctioned. It is also something that has been mainly overlooked by gender studies so far, um, as they focus the gender studies mostly on the context of crime. The focus has primarily been on either the results of the crime, meaning statistics. If you look up at those articles I mentioned you before, you will see a lot of statistics and a lot of numbers. This is insofar important for criminal law as it shows the results of the criminal policy and the overall prevalence rates. But on the other side, it does not give you the full picture on what criminal law is, what stands behind, how it can change, and what actually the correlation is between those numbers and the criminal offenses that were described beforehand. Another topic that was discussed by gender studies and is not so close connected to criminal law is the social basis for this development with regard to, for example, inequality, violence. What has not been treated as much or not as it should be is the legal text as such. In Serbia, we mostly talk about the criminal code, our codification from 2006. In other countries, it's pretty much the same, whereby we have a lot of bi-legislation, even more than Serbia on that. Just a question for you who are present here. Are you from Serbia or are you from some other country? Serbia, okay, then you know what I'm talking about. So criminal code is, is, our, main, is our main source. Um, <clears throat> so it's not only about the wording, it's about also the interpretation, examples from jurisdiction, and so on. Now, by adding the dogmatic component, it would complete the holistic approach when it comes to gender and crime, as this is our topic or in general on the issues and questions on gender and crime. Of course, and this is very important to annotate, another disclaimer maybe, this will not be possible in an extensive way, which means it's not possible to go through each and every um, norm of the criminal code or some other criminal law and to search for flaws when it comes to gender. It's not possible. Um, it will it would somehow um, overextend our our goal here because no it should be like this because criminal law and such or what is important when it comes to this is the precise identification and analysis of the relevant gender related and problematic aspects of a particular legislation criminal law as such is not formulated in a manner that suits one gender or the other when the criminal lawmaker makes writes his proposal, he does not think of gender. He thinks only on the prohibited um, behavior and in which way it should be prescribed, only of that. Afterwards, when we come to interpret it, some of the regulations as judges or as experts or somebody from the theory, etc., so on, then we can add our view on this, on this particular topic. But from the beginning on, there is no inherent gender-related um, connection. So what we do here is actually something pretty new, I have to say, which also means that it's not as extensive as it is in other areas of law. If you think, for example, of labor law, you know that we have uh, the gender pay gap and we are all very familiar with that, we talk about that and we are very much in line about the issue that this is something that should be eliminated. However, when it comes to criminal law, first of all, uh, we need to find where, this, where these gender connections are. It's the first thing to do. 
it's both in general part and in the special part and this is also what my relation what my presentation will be about but also secondly and you will see it when we talk when you come to talk about the special part even there when we talk about some very particular issues and i tried to search and to find for you the most interesting ones um there will not be uh, one unisonal voice about that. So not everybody would treat or see an offense as such as necessary as you may think that it should be. Now, and by this I will, I will come to the, to the end of my introduction, actually. The two most important, or the introduction of the introduction, the two most important areas of criminal law, as you may have heard, are the dogmatics of criminal law and criminal policy. And when it comes to criminal policy, you may find basically every day a critical review of the mild to non-existent criminal policy with regard to certain crimes. It's enough that you open up the newspapers and you will see those, this guy, this perpetrator, this monstrous um, person has committed this and this crime, however, he did, did not get punished. However, the issue of criminal law dogmatics in the general context has remained excluded so far. So we would today deal with both of them, both criminal policy and dogmatics. Um, one reason for that, for this exclusion actually of dogmatics, is also, to be honest, the non-existing interest of researchers in the field of criminal law, and uh, which is understandable so far as they have left it to the criminologists and feminists to deal with it. So it's not something that is regarded as our topic, to be very honest with you. And the second reason for that is that the institutes of criminal law follow a certain logic, which does not, as I have said, contain direct relations to gender. So it's not obvious in the first place. And the third reason for that, why others, not only the criminal law scholars, but others have not dealt with it, is that you have to be very fluent when it comes to criminal law dogmatics. It's not that easy also um, to, be, to be frank with you. Yes. Now, what will the structure of my presentation be? Once again, I encourage you, if you have a question or a comment, feel free. To oppose it. Um, the structure of the pre presentation will be as follows. The introduction I mostly gave you so far. Then afterwards we will talk about a very specific um, legal document. It's the Istanbul Convention or the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence from 2011. And there we will focus on criminal provisions that are entailed in Articles 33 to 48. There, and this is something that is laudable, has been done, also not mentioned as such, but there has been done a division between a general and a special part, which is insofar good for us criminal law researchers, as it is something that uh, we know, we can identify with, and it's also a sign um, why this convention as such is good, maybe better or definitely better than other international um, law instruments because it does follow the logic of an actually internal positive area of law. There is no strict division or ignorance as it sometimes may happen between international and criminal law, which is something that is very criticized when it comes, for example, to international criminal law uh, with regard to war crimes, etc., the Rome Statute, etc. Um, no, this is something very different and something that has to be um, applauded. And uh, in the end, I will also, or near to the end, I will mention some, so to say, new crimes or new forms of, um, one we may call it also gender-based violence that is emerging, not so much in our national legislation, even less in the practice, I have to be honest, but in the comparative uh, legal surroundings, which does not mean that this will not uh, be the topic of our interest in a very near future. And in the end, I will have or have a give you and uh, talk about you about some aspects that go beyond the things I have mentioned so far. So, I told you before, um, we do not, we do have statistics, but do not focus on them so much. However, I couldn't resist to show you this particular statistic. It's, uh, although it is from 2015, it's very comprehensive as it tackles the issues that we will today talk about. And um, I will, it's very, I don't know if you can see it very good, I will read it out. Um, first of all, 
Um, a number that does not surprise very much is that 95% of victims that are trafficked uh, for sexual exploitation, there are more uh, bases for which you can be trafficked as a human being, but particularly for sexual exploitation in the European Union, that is where the statistics comes from, uh, is um, are women. Not, not surprisingly, and mostly women from, um, Eastern, from Eastern Europe. A number that is also um, interesting it is that 1 in 20 women have been raped, that 1 in 5 women have been stalked, that 1 in 3 women have experienced physical and or sexual violence. In this regard, I have to say that the issue of physical violence uh, and sexual violence is something that is emerging and is also an issue that is not treated in every country the same way, which means that something that actually is violence, either physical or sexual, uh, of course to a less extent than compared to, to rape, of course, is not always considered as such, which means it is also always not reported um, as violence or not because it's not basically um, seen, um, felt as such. And uh, one in two women have experienced sexual harassment. The things I have said before goes even more for sexual harassment, as you can regard many things as uh, harassing, but uh, the level of tolerance for women in this regard can also be very and are very, um, very differing. Now, um, the Istanbul Convention, why do we focus on that? Also, to be very frank with you, this is uh, the, maybe the only international document uh, that deals with this issue in such a direct manner. And not only gender and crime or gender competent criminal law, not only um, in a cohesive, coherent way, but it is also um, um, a human rights treaty that is opposing very directly, you can see it in its name, I will repeat it again, it's the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence. It's a human rights treaty that goes against violence against women and domestic violence. And um, it was opened up for signature uh, on the 11th of May 2011 in Istanbul, Turkey. And it was, that's why it's called Istanbul Convention, logically, but it was done so on purpose in the Istanbul um, in Istanbul because um, the Turkish society as such had some issues in this regard for many years. Let's see if somebody is... No. I'm looking at the... No, I think we have somebody from Turkey. We have one. Yes. Okay. May, maybe uh, maybe he or she... Sehri Ban Imrak. She. Maybe she can add something on that or comment on that later on. Hello, uh, thank you very much. Actually, yes, I'm from Turkey, but I'm in France now. Uh, regarding to the Istanbul Convention, it's a little bit complicated. Uh, you maybe know uh, Turkey, uh, uh, come on, I have to say. Uh, Last year, Turkey was uh, withdrawn from Istanbul Convention. We are not in the Istanbul Convention now. It is just uh, uh, with the decision of the president, unfortunately, uh, because they think that it is against the so-called family values. Uh, but for the entering uh, to the Istanbul Convention, it is a little bit different. I'm not from the uh, law department, I'm from uh, history and sociology, so I'm not very, very uh, well qualified to talk about the law for the, for the moment. But if I'm not wrong, it, wa it started with the, um, a woman who called Topos, and he went to the justice uh, 33 times, but without uh, any, um, uh, any, how to say, any, um, any solutions. And then uh, they get murdered. And then that's why uh, Istanbul Convention is, uh, came into, uh, how to say, yeah, that's why European Union started to uh, work on Istanbul Convention, actually. 
uh, I will just try to find the case and uh, send it to, uh, send it to you in the chat. Uh, you can also, um, as we are really not that many, um, hello and welcome, um, as we are not that many uh, um, here, um, you may also add it up later because um, I, I switch a bit and now I'll come directly to Turkey. So in the meantime, you can look it up. Um, regarding the state parties, um, there is a specific symbolical um, aspect to it because the Istanbul Convention was on purpose. Uh, open up for for signature in Istanbul, but at the same time, Turkey, as you you can see it on the slide, is um, the first and so far only and hopefully the only country that has withdrawn um, from the convention. It happened so in 2021, after it was denounced on March 20th in 2021, and it ceased to be effective on the 1st of July of this year. Um, yeah, Sekerman has already mentioned that, uh, that this was the decision of the Turkish President Erdogan and in an official statement he blamed the LGBT community for the withdrawal from the convention, arguing that the Istanbul Convention, I quote, originally intended to promote women's rights, but it was hijacked by a group of people attempting to normalize homosexuality, which is incompatible with Turkey's social and family values. Hence, the decision to withdraw. So, hijacking by another group that was interesting, interested in the same issues was the main reason for the withdrawal. And um, I know that there, was, there were legal concerns about this withdrawal because although it was ac accepted uh, and went through the parliament of Turkey, the withdrawal as such was done by presidential decree and the issue was raised whether he actually had the possibility, the power to do so. In the end, um, the legal interpretation on that was that it was possible, so it was legally um, okay. Uh, however, the, the um, repercussions on that were not very well. Everybody, especially in the European Union, has raised concerns about that, and I can only imagine how it was in Turkey. If you think or if you look up at the news on March the 8th, Women's International Women's Day, you will always each and every year see protests in Turkey, in Istanbul especially. So they ha since always have had a particular meaning and especially since this withdrawal from 2021, they gained um, uh, even greater, greater momentum. I will uh, come back to you or I will I'll come back to the other numbers that I mentioned here on the slide. So, um, so far, signed and ratified, the Convention has 37 countries. The number has risen compared to two years ago. But the countries that have remained outside of it are, are Armenia, Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, EU, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, and Slovakia. Interestingly enough, the EU uh, as well. And um, I looked up the reasons for that or the arguments that, that were raised uh, why this was so. Uh -huh. okay. um, <clears throat> so the most, in, the most legally interesting case was that of Bulgaria, because in Bulgaria in 2018, the, it was declared unconstitutional because uh, gender can be defined as non-biological according to the Istanbul Convention. And as you can see, I put the definition of gender which is inherent, which is part of the, um, of the convention. It states that it is the socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities, and attributes that the given society considers appropriate for women and um, men, so for both. However, uh, what was um, criticized in Bulgaria it is that gender can also be a social category, not only a biological one, which goes against the constitution of Bulgaria, where humans are irrevocably defined as biologically male or female with equal standing as citizens. So the constitution entails a biological definition of gender, whereas the definition of gender from the Istanbul Convention can also be interpreted or is interpreted in a, um, another way. When it comes to Latvia, 
a very recent example was the case of a femicide in April this year. And in the context of widespread violence against the woman, 100 protesters, which is a lot for a small country or a country not as big as Latvia, gathered in front of the parliament. In the same uh, month, however, the government in its large majority refused refuse to ratify the Istanbul Convention, saying the main issue is indifference and that there are enough laws in place to tackle this issue. When it comes to Slovakia, also interesting thing is that the parliament, the Slovakian parliament is against it, whereas the president, the new elected, Susana Chaputova, is in favor of the um, ratification of uh, the Istanbul Convention. However, um, she obliged and um, did not push further the issue of uh, the ratification of the Istanbul, Istanbul Convention. As you can see, Armenia, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, and Slovakia, those are all countries from Eastern Europe, which means that the issue of gender there is definitely a different one when it comes to other countries that are state parties to the Council, uh, that are parties to the Council of Europe. Uh, coming back to the Istanbul Convention and its importance, it is, why, why do we talk about that? It's something very concrete. In this issue, which is not, which is not always um, tackable and feasible when it comes to criminal law, this is something we can deal with. Although it's an international legal instrument, it is, and there's its, in, its importance, it is the first legally binding instrument which creates a comprehensive legal framework and approach to combat violence against women. It is focused, especially as you can see it in its name, domestic violence, protecting victims and prosecuting accused offenders. The convention has been recognized as essential for gender competent criminal law as it provides a new basis and enhances the development regarding respective offenses. The reason for that is that it entails provisions that go beyond the usual regulation of international documents, as I have mentioned before, and it provides an entry at the same time into dogmatics of criminal law, yet from a gender point of view. So it's a good mixture if you wanted to see so. In the preamble of the convention, this link is underlined by the acknowledgments of the structural nature of violence against women as gender-based violence. That So it has a structural component. Then women and girls are exposed to a higher risk of gender-based violence than men, which is also a fact. But at the same time, this means also that men may also be victims of domestic violence. So they are not, not excluded. Although the focus or the situation and practice is that the women are mostly the ones that are affected, that does not mean that men cannot be um, triggered or do not fall under the scope of this convention as well. And this is something that the critics, the critics of the convention do not see or do not want to see. Uh, regarding the structure of the, of the convention, um, it contains 81 articles separated into 12 chapters. And the structure of the instrument is based on the four Ps uh, when it comes to international law, prevention, protection and support of victims, prosecution of offenders and integrated policies. So prevention, protection, prosecution and policies. After a sufficient number of um, um, signatures, the convention came into force on August the 1st, 2014. When it comes to Serbia, we have amended our legislation, our criminal code, and we have introduced new criminal offenses two years later in 2016. Later on, I can maybe at the end, I can say maybe a few more words about, about um, that. Mm -hmm. I have a question about Montenegro. Did they sign the... Yes, 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 yes. Montenegro was one of them, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, um, when, it, um, when it comes to, to the issues that are covered um, by the Istanbul Convention, I will start with something that is not covered by the Istanbul Convention, but that comes from the USA as the feminist approach or the issue of gender as such, uh, as we all know, actually stems, originates from the US, US context. 
and this is something called the battered woman syndrome. As you can see it, uh, Lena Walker, she is an American psychologist, and as you may or may know that psychology in America and USA has a different standing than here, uh, she defined in already 1979 what a battered woman is. It is a woman 18 years of age or over, so not a minor, who is or has been in an intimate relationship with a man who repeatedly subjects or subjected her to forceful physical and or psychological, psychological um, abuse. So when we talk about institutes of the general part, they usually have a universal validity. They're not shaped for this or for that a particular victim or perpetrator, and especially with no regard to gender whatsoever. So as the name says it, they are general institutes. However, the battered woman syndrome is an example of how an institute can be reshaped and how it can be adjusted to something that is connected to gender. The battered woman syndrome or is actually a defense that has been used by women who argue that their only means of escaping life-threatening abuse is to kill their husbands. So they have been beaten that long, that much, that the only way to come out of it was actually to kill, to kill um, their husbands. You see this definition of Lena Walker, and when you come up, up on the syndrome, you always start with this definition. And she actually based much of her, of her theory on the battered woman syndrome on research that involved something that is called learned helplessness, first in animals, after she uh, continued to do so her research on people. And later on, she sought to confirm the theory by studying 400 battered women in six, in six US states from the period of 1978, so she started a bit before, to 1981. Her hypothesis was that the battering occurred as a cycle. And this cycle entailed, first of all, a phase where the tension was built, so a tension building phase, then an acute battering phase, and in the end, a reconciliation phase. You know, when you were beaten up, at the end, many women um, tend to reconcile, to make peace with, with their perpetrators. It's, it happens a lot, they live in the same uh, household, they have no other options, they don't, do not know that they can do something else besides that, besides uh, staying passive. So this is something that she has um, seen, has recognized, identified in her research. Since the inception of BDS, almost 40 years ago, or even more, she has revised, however, this description to include a cluster of psychological sequels from living in a violent relationship, which can include and this is new, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral deficits, which negatively influence a woman from leaving a relationship after the battering occurs. Now, um, what is the issue, what is the point of the battered woman syndrome? Uh, with regard to criminal law, it expands the concept of legal self-defense. This is how it's treated in the, in the U.S., this defense holds that a battered woman is virtually held hostage in a violent household by a man who isolates and terrorizes her. It's usually this way. The man captures the woman. It's, it's very seldomly that it's the other way around, convincing her that if she leaves, he will track her down and kill her. A self-defense claim traditionally requires defendants to prove that they were confronted, and now this is the definition of self-defense in the US. The definition in Serbia, as you all know, is slightly different, and also the issue of the battered woman syndrome would be treated in Serbia in a um, slight, not in a slight, in a different way, although the outcome in the end would be the same, uh, the criminal offense could not be established. So what is the self-defense issue in the US? The claim traditionally it requires defendants to prove that they were confronted with an unprovoked attack. So unprovoked attack is the first element. Then that the threat of injury or death was imminent, so near danger. The threat of injury or death was imminent. Then, in addition, everything is seen, has to be seen cumulatively, that the degree of force used was objectively reasonable. 
So her way of coping with the attack was objectively, not from her point of view, but from a uh, bystander's point of view, objectively reasonable, and that they had objectively reasonable fear of being injured or killed without the use of force. So that we as bystanders at the same time believe her when she said that she had she was um, in fear and danger of being injured or killed without the use of force. In self-defense cases where expert witness testimony on this syndrome is offered as a justification, so in the US it's a justification ground, also it's called in Serbian, this is the treatment as it has there, as I said. Uh, the adherence to the above elements is often disputed on appeal. This means that Although it is often raised, it is not always acknowledged as such. For example, in a very um, one of the earliest cases, in the case State v. Kelly from 1982, the defendant was charged with the murder of her husband. And she sought to introduce testimony on the battered woman syndrome. So, so her claim was that she was beaten that much, she suffered that much that in the end she had no other way than to kill her husband. Um, and she argued that in the setting of being choked repeatedly by her husband earlier that day, so that was the exact um, occasion, she stabbed him in an act of self-defense. The trial court excluded this testimony as irrelevant and found her guilty of manslaughter. On appeal, she argued on, and the Supreme Court of New Jersey later agreed, in, two years later in 1984, that expert witness testimony on the battered woman syndrome was relevant to show the objective reasonableness of the defendant's perception of danger. So it is basically uh, the issue that the expert, expert in the court has to confirm that the defendant's, her perception that she was in danger was objectively reasonable enough. So it's not about what she actually thought, rightly or wrongly, but whether this could have objectively been confirmed, affirmed as such. Mm, since its introduction, as I said many years ago, at least in the US, uh, the battered woman syndrome has often been raised by female defendants pursuing traditional or imperfect self-defense cases. So, which means that the woman was in a situation to inflict justification in the form of self-defense, but however, some element was missing in her defense. And in this, let's say, um, space, she, where this one element was missing, she um, invoked this battered woman syndrome. This is something that you will not find in Serbian legislation or in jurisdiction anywhere. I also dare to say that you will not find many um, um, many articles on this issue because not only is it something that is particular important um, recognized in the US, but it is something that in our, um, in our jurisdiction is treated in a different way, not through one particular institute. It is treated, may be treated as um, mitigating, um, sit, um, attenuating um, circumstance when it comes to sentencing, but however, as an institute as such, it's not known. So despite the limitations in research on uh, this issue, the criticism it has um, ex um, experience and the lack of recognition as a psychiatric diagno diagnosis. So the battered woman syndrome, it's not a diagnosis, it's not um, something that is recognized by American psychologists. However, it is still used in U.S. criminal courts, including cases outside of typical self-defense, the things I mentioned before. And the case law suggests that expert witness testimony on the battered woman syndrome is often admissible in jurisdictions across the United States, yet its use in criminal defenses has received mixed responses from different courts, however, still, until today. And the concept of this syndrome has evolved in recent years 
as there is growing recognition, this is something that is a new development in the U.S., that intimate partner violence, which effectively is the most prominent case of this syndrome, does not affect women alone, and so men can also be included, and that the perpetration of the intimate partner violence can take many forms. Um, what was or what is seen as kind of compromise is that it's treated as a subcategory of the post-traumatic stress disorder. So it's not an illness, but it is a form of a post-traumatic stress disorder, a psychological trauma that results in the following physical, psychological, and or sexual abuse, typically from an intimate partner. So this is, this is the, the, let's say, the uh, accepted definition so far as a compromise. Yes, please. So uh, I have the question regarding the very act uh, when when this is invoked. Uh, so it's you said it's not uh, uh, the act of self-defense in in that case. Self-defense is something other. Uh, so it can be used in the court as a defense if a woman kills husband. I know, like premeditated killing or whatever, but she was constantly abused. Is that uh, I mean? Yeah. Uh, no. 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 So no. 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 It no. It has to be the act of violence happening, and she kills yes. her husband. Yes. Yes. The point is, in uh, the common law system, is, is slightly is, is not slightly. It's different than our system, but we can we can put it on a, on a general level. Um, if you commit a crime, you search for a way to, uh, let's say, decompose the notion of crime. And for this, as one element of crime, you have something that is called unlawfulness. So, there are certain grounds of just called justific justification grounds or reasons for justification uh, with which you may be exempted. So, you have, you have committed a crime, but due to those circumstances, you the the thing that you have done this crime as such will in the end not be established because the element of unlawfulness is missing and when it comes to this syndrome the battered woman syndrome it was invoked in cases of self-defense and serbia it would be so this means that all the elements that would need it to be present in this particular case were present. However, the women, we may say it, I may say it in a, in a, in a maybe non too academician way, overreacted. The way she um, pushed away the attacker was too forceful. She could have done that in a different way without committing the crime or committing the crime in a less intrusive, less intensive manner. And by basically overstepping the limitations, and that's what it's about, uh, overstepping the limitations of uh, self-defense, she actually could not not invoke self-defense because the um, conditions, uh, the presumptions I mentioned before, the requirements, I will mention them once again, were existent but not completely. Something was missing. And in this regard, the whole concept of legal self-defense, which could... Um, which could pardon her in some kind of way could not be used. I will repeat those requirements when it comes to um, when it comes to um, U.S. to common law, and so this is. Mm -hmm. Sure. So Should I repeat? I, it? Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, no. I will. Uh, so we are close to the end of this per first lecture. So I will put uh, uh, the question, but it's not necessary that you respond now. Mm -hmm. You, it can be at the end, but what what I need to to have a clarification from the beginning uh, of your uh, presentation. You started with uh, national criminal national framework of criminal code, generally speaking, and you uh, uh, stated that uh, they are rather conservative, traditional, uh, insensitive towards feminist approach. Then immediately I started speaking feminist, feminist critical legal uh, scholars are necessary within criminal law, that's obvious. Uh, and when you as the feminist critical legal lawyer and the others uh, want to reconsider uh, criminal, uh, dogmatic of criminal code, 
which would be the main topics. Oh, evidently, then you, you switch to uh, Istanbul Con Convention and Continental Legal Framework, then uh, uh, American uh, and Common Law uh, Legal Framework. But Mike, and you also mentioned uh, the revision of the Criminal Code of Serbia in 2016 under the uh, influence of Istanbul Convention. So my question, very simply, I'm not competent, but I want to hear something at the end or now about which main topics like rape, like prevention, protection, prosecution policies re related to gender-based violence and what else uh, are the main topics which, which refer to gender uh, sensitive and competent dimension of criminal law and how much Istanbul Convention and these uh, common law uh, cases of the better wom uh, uh, women's syndrome uh, legacy have really made uh, impact to the, these two traditional criminal law codifications be re revised? Or if uh, still not, when, how, and how should they be revised? Regarding the question when and how, that's a good question. Nobody knows the answer. And uh, the red line or the red thread you're searching is actually um, the institutes. So my approach, my perspective on this, on this issue is the perspective of a criminal lawyer, which means the first part is the characterization of criminal law as such. What can you expect or cannot expect from criminal law? What is the, uh, in, what is the starting point of criminal law? then we look at everything that comes afterwards through the eyes of the general part and the special part. To rape, etc., I will come later on to particular offenses. This will be the um, next part of the presentation. But when it comes to the general part, that they are uh, simply put institutes that are valid for all crimes that come afterwards. They are the things you put in the front of everything that's coming afterwards, and this is why it's it, why it is universally valid. When it comes to the Istanbul Convention, you will see it after a few slides. There is well, the main institute we can deal with when it comes to gender competent criminal law is exactly this element of unlawfulness. Why? Because it somehow exams, pardons what has been done. You cannot tackle this issue that much through the form of guilt because it's too, um, too restricted, not only in our system, but also in general. Whereas in the, with the third element of crime, which is un unlawfulness, you may create, and this is the crucial point here, you may create some new justification grounds. And if you create new justification grounds, this means that you actually pardon the things that have been done. So like an exemption of committing the crime. And this is the opening gate in the dogmatics of criminal law when we, spoke, when we speak about the general part, where this issue of gender can enter. Only there. Because uh, when you have the legal act, in, in Serbian, I will focus now on the Serbian, um, Serbian criminal law, you have the um, legal act, you have typicity, you have unlawfulness, and you have guilt. When you have those four elements of crime, you have the crime in its full objective, subjective um, form. Now, and this goes for each and every crime. Now, this is the, the let's say, the general um, model of it. When we talk about the act, it's, it's, I will not go into that. There is no room, also no room in typicity to... to, okay, to uh -huh. Please, just mm -hmm. explain to me and maybe to others mm -hmm. uh, uh, where the topic of the category, the very general, well, very universal category of the victim and all the category... Uh, so where, where does it mm -hmm. belong? And... and uh, couldn't the whole criminal law general part of the dogmatic as well as the specific one be reconsidered from the EU human rights point of view? I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because uh, it's very hard to do some criminal law. Okay. It's, it's very formalist, it's very dogmatic. When it comes to the victim, the victim as such, as such is not an element of crime. It can be seen within typicity. In, this, in the second, as a second element, yes. 
And uh, we have it uh, in our, for example, criminal code, we have many examples where minors um, are victims of this particular offense. And if they are victims, then the punishment that was prescribed for victimizing them is usually stricter, higher than for other um, victims. However, there is no such thing apart from rape, etc., where a woman as a victim is recognized as a particularly um, sensitive category that has to be protected in a more, more intense way. So in our criminal code, who the only category as such that is, that is protected more than the others are minors. Women as such have not been recognized as such or as a category that is worth to be protected in, a, in this way. And I wanted to, to, to talk about that at the end. I would just only mention that now. There is also no outcry currently in criminal law dogmatics or when it comes to criminal policy that this, that this changes. So um, now, unfortunately, in Serbia, we're talking about the issue of empathy, of the criminal responsibility of minors, or to be more precise, of children, etc. So this is an issue that is now tackled, or violence as such, is tackled by anyone. However, when it comes to issues where women were victims, there was no such big outcry. So I would dare to say that the Serbian community as such is more sensitive to issues where children are involved, whether as victims, definitely as victims, or as perpetrators, especially when it comes, when it has a sexual dimension. People are very sensitive on that. However, when we talk about women in this very same situation, to be very frank, not many people will react the same way. There is no urge, no outcry, no movement to change the criminal code, which is our main legal source, to add this dimension to that. Recently, there was or there is discussion on enhancing the protection of journalists, for example, in the criminal code, but, you know, a very specific topic, very specific issue, issue very specific category. Something like that, something similar like that, does not exist for women. Simply does but not. But normatively, normatively speaking, it should have could be existed or could have um, existed. Um, it's you will not find, or it's very hard to find a legislation worldwide in a comparative view that you can describe as gender gender sensitive in this way. So we will not find it. Uh, there is. Um, general understanding that, as I said, minus children are especially protect-worthy. Women, as such, do not fall into this category. When we speak normatively, what could be done? It could be done with regard of typicity that you prescribe an aggravated form of a criminal offense if the, offen if the victim was a woman. This could happen, or this is something that we theoretically could think about, but knowing the developments, not only here, but in general, this will not happen any soon because because afterwards other issues would be raised um, and it would be a two let's let's put it this way the universal understanding of criminal law would be relativized in this way so there is not even a movement to to change to change that so what is the second way or another way um, to introduce the gender perspective is through the third not through the second but for the third element of crime, which is unlawfulness. And this is something that has been done so far. This is the reason why I mentioned the battered woman syndrome. Although it's not known as such in our legislation, it is known worldwide or especially in the US. And this is something that exists. It's not, it's not everywhere accepted. It's not even accepted by all courts and judicial, judicial practice. But however, it's had been, it has been recognized as such. It has been defined as such. And it even went through this development. So you may have you seen it before um, from Leonor Walker. Her very definition of the battered woman syndrome was enlarged. So she herself saw uh, additional aspects to it. And today, as I said, it's not regarded as a strict diagnosis, as an illness, mental illness, but it's seen as a subcategory of post-traumatic stress disorder. This is something that can be taken, uh, taken into account. If we speak about Serbian law, how it would be treated here, it would not be treated um, 
as a way um, through unlawfulness, not in this context, but it would be treated on the fourth element of crime, guilt, as some kind of insanity or diminished sanity. It would be treated in this, in this kind of way in our, in our legal system. So everything we speak about when we talk about the general part of criminal law, we have to see it through those four elements of crime. Act, typicity, unlawfulness or guilt. We have to put it in those forms. There is no other way, or speaking about the general part, to add the gender issue. There, there is none. There is none. And um, if you look at the, at the amendments we've done in 2016, and this was no surprise, we added new criminal offenses. And it, was, it is something that is uh, the better way to deal with this issue because, uh, first of all, you, or when you add a criminal offense into the criminal code, this means that you have to prescribe it in a way that is as precise as possible uh, in order to respect the principle of legality, which is the main principle in criminal law. So you have to be precise. This is the first issue. And the second issue is later on, this is not something to be underestimated, when you look at the judicial statistics at the end of each year in Serbia, uh, for example, in 2023, in December 2023, we will get the statistics for 2022. So there's always, a, understandably, a time lag, time gap in between. So we can track down, actually, the number of crimes that have been committed in this regard. Um, so so this is, this is the, the issue when it comes uh, to the question you asked me. So it's very formalized. You've seen it for one of those uh, for uh, elements and the only open gate so far which can be seen as such is the third element of unlawfulness and why I mentioned the better women's syndrome it's not something that's entailed in the Istanbul Convention but it is an institute of general part but I will I will go on and now we will, we will close this issue on on unlawfulness um, I will only uh, regarding your question I, will, I wanted to um, to answer you or to complete my answer is regarding self-defense so, self-defense as such would be fulfilled, but something is missing. The woman overreacted in some kind of way. So, uh, the, in, in the U.S., the um, elements that need to be established in order to, that we are able to talk about self-defense, that there was an unprovoked attack, that the threat of injury or death was imminent, that the degree of force used was objectively reasonable and that they had objectively reasonable fear of being injured or killed without the use of force. So what is here problematic are the third and the fourth issue that the degree of force used was objectively reasonable and even more problematic is the fourth element that they had objectively reasonable fear of being injured or killed without the use of force. And that's why the, uh, the um, legal opinion of an expert witness in, in the court is important because he has, to, uh, he has to confirm that the woman, the battered woman, had objectively, reasonably been feared about being injured or killed without the use of force. So he has to witness about her mental state of mind, basically. So in the end, that's why... Uh, her sole invocation of this syndrome is not enough. It has to be confirmed by him. And this is the issue where it's not always done, so not always confirmed uh, in, in, the, in the US. And one question, just it's mm -hmm. brief. So is this a uh, practice for allevi alleviating circumstances or it's practice that is invoked for a complete acquittal of the... Of the it's, it's basically the complete acquittal uh, because the um, crime as such cannot be established. So this element is missing, so there is, there is no crime as such. So acquittal, yeah. I also have a question. Mm -hmm. Can we extend this syndrome to, to children who are maybe witnessing domestic violence in the house and can we say that uh, maybe they're influenced uh, and if, if they react in, in, in that way, can we also uh, invoke this in court? Mm -hmm. Um, good question. Um, the answer, but the answer would be um, more no than yes. Why? First of all, uh, when you look at the at the definition, and this is the the let's say the very general definition, it stems from intimate partner violence. So this also means that they have intimate relationships that go beyond the relationship 
of a parent and a child, first of all. Uh, secondly, it has to have a certain duration. It can also have with the, with the child, but not necessarily. When parents fight with each other, uh, they often do so that their children does not see them, for example. So it's not something that is, uh, that is um, necessarily done in, in the public part of the private life, so to say. And uh, the main argument why children would hardly could be involved is they, um, that the force they use is uh, seldomly um, overreacted. So a child cannot harm the parent as much as a wife or a woman can do, simply because they're not strong enough. So in order to, to kill somebody, for a child to kill, to, to, to kill the parent, it's, it's, um, um, it's hardly that this would happen in practice. It would either be the other way around, that the parent, when he was attacked by a child, for example, because the child then, um, uh, the child then um, illegally actually attacks, attacks um, the parent, it would rather be that the parent then uh, 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 drags off the child in a way with unreasonable use of force. So the child would then be injured. So it would, in the end, the result would be the other way around. So those are the reasons why children and such could not be um, included, especially because, and this I may add also, this battered woman syndrome has this... Um, this relationship into in, involved, uh, it's implemented. So a child, as such, is is particularly um, vulnerable. Yes, but could not be included into into this syndrome. No, no. Mm -hmm. What if the child is not a little child? Is like 15, 16 years old. Uh, that's a good question, uh, because then the use of force could fall within. If you have a minor who's let's say 16, 17, he could he could actually. Um, he could actually um, uh, uh, battle with, with the attacker, but however, this issue of intimate partner violence and this duration and this um, characteristics of their being constantly um, violated is missing. So one part, yes, the use of force would, could be there, but at the same time, um, the other issues would not be, the other, the other requirements would not be fulfilled. So also more no than yes. But this is something that, um, that is uh, for the ju judicial practice to establish. So it's, it's on them to decide whether this was possible or not. And this always depends on the circumstances, circumstances of a particular case. In general, I told you how I see it. It's definitely more than a child, but also not satisfying in a, in a, in a, in a full manner. Yeah, but, mm -hmm. Here I was referring to the cases, for example, where uh, I don't know, in most cases probably boy uh, is witnessing that his father is, I don't know, beating or raping or whatever uh, his mother and he wants to protect her and because of that maybe he has some kind of uh, post-traumatic syndrome or something and then he wants to kill his father, even if he is not uh, abused by his father in order to protect his mother. That, that's why I was referring to this, but uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Um, if, you, if you can, also for minors, um, if you can, um, I mean, the sanctions for them uh, fall under juvenile criminal law and the, ra the ratio, the logic there is, 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 is different. But um, nonetheless, um, there we would talk about insanity and it, this, this would go then in a different direction. It is then not any more related to gender, but, but good, good question as such. Thank you. Um, so, um, yes, and also just to, to add up on this um, is that from our point of view, from Serbian point of view, what is problematic here is the proportionality of the defense. So this is something that, that would be, that would be um, missing here. Now, um, yes, let's go to the second institute of the general part, and it's called, um, as you can see it, Marry Your Rapist Law. I think the name as such tells you um, everything, or it's, it's very um, obvious what it's about. A Marry Your Rapist Law is, or Rape Marriage Law, is a rule in a jurisdiction under which a man who commits rape, sexual assault, abduction, or other similar acts is exonerated if he marries his female victim 
or in some jurisdictions at least offers to marry her. The marry rapist law is actually a legal way of the, for the accused to avoid prosecution or punishment by marrying his victim. And if we um, look at it from a broader perspective, this is effectively perpetu perpetuating forced marriage. So on the other side, which is itself a crime as such. But however, this is a paradox. Um, a crime as such is here seen as an element which excludes the, cons the, the crime that was committed before. So basically a form of modern slavery. That's how it's, how it's treated, how it's treated um, today. Um, if you look at the pictures, uh, I, I think you can see you can see it. So the bride and the, and the convicted, although he's not convicted because he has not committed a crime when it comes to this marry rapist law, or um, on the on the right side, how I met your mother raped her when she was um, 13, and this is something that is um, more usual than you think. It's still um, there exists right now in 12 countries exists such marry you rapist um, laws, uh, meaning that there is a norm in criminal law which allows this kind of situation. There are more informal, um, informal, or let's put it this way, there are more than 12 societies worldwide where this is also accepted, although not in a formal way. So it, informally it's, it functions um, the same. Although the terms for this phenomenon were coined in the 2010s, so relatively recently is, has this, this term gained momentum, um, the practice, this practice, Mary Rapist Law, has existed in a number of legal systems in history and continues to exist in some societies today in various forms, if I've said, as I've said it. Such laws were common around the world until the 1970s. And then, since the late 20th century, the remaining laws of this type have been increasingly challenged and repealed in the number of countries. Laws that allow courts to authorize an underage marriage on account of the pregnancy of a female minor when she is below the age of consent, commonly or usually with parental consent, can in practice be a way for a statutory rapist, so somebody who has slept um, with an underage child, to avoid prosecution for the statutory rape of, of it. The law, the Mary Rapist Law, has been justified as a recognition of the cultural value that was placed upon female virginity at marriage, in which, I quote, the spoiled girls and women are a source of shame for their families, innocent of wrongdoing, though they may be. So it's basically, although it was not her fault, she's not a virgin anymore, and she has become uh, a shame to her family. And in order to uh, balance this out, uh, she is expected to, uh, to, marry, to marry the perpetrator of, of rape. And as I've said it before, I think this is the case in Peru, if I'm correct, um, there it was even, um, uh, no, in Costa Rica, a rapist was exonerated if he expresses an intention to marry the victim, even if she knows, even if she does not accept it. So it was in Costa Rica enough that the perpetrator, the rapist, only says that he has the intention to uh, marry the victim. She does not have to say yes to it. Nonetheless, he was exonerated. So um, it went really that, that far because the virginity was lost and everything else was only um, second place. What is the problem with this loss? I mean, this, uh, the, the sole notion of calling this a law is, is a paradox as such. Um, it violates the dignity of women and degrade them by allowing them to be traded as possessions between the families, and that's what it's about. It also implies that rape is not a serious crime. It's something that has happened. And the victim is basically blamed, not the perpetrator. And she is the one that is expected to adjust to the new situation, whether she wants it or not. As I have said it before, there are jurisdictions where the raped girl, woman, has to consent. But there are also jurisdictions and informal combinations or contexts where parental consent, so where, the, where it's enough that the parents consent to it, uh, which means further victimization for the rape victim. It continues in, in the marriage and impunity for the perpetrator. So it's a lose-win situation. 
As a result of this, many women do not report their sexual assault because they fear this as a shame and also the possibility of being murdered by a family member. So they're being raped and probably uh, have a clue of what might happen afterwards. They're very afraid because they're not virgins anymore. And as such, the, there's a shift of guilt basically to them and they do not report these cases in order, first of all, if they are old enough to, to know that this might happen, not to be forced to marry the rapist or just to avoid um, problems, problems with the family as they are not virgins anymore. If a woman simply marries a rapist, she preserves her family name on the other side and avoids a life of sexual shame. So there's an ongoing perpetuated um, rape, basically, in the marriage, the marital rape. Um, why is that so? The reason for that, and this is the, the patriarchal moment here, is that a woman was considered to be the property of her father. And if she was raped, she was considered a damaged property. Uh, so the rapist must either pay compensation or accept the damaged goods. So we talk in very, very um, economical um, terms and marry the victim. To avoid paying the family, the perpetrator often chooses to marry the victim who had absolutely no choice but to marry the rapist and spend the rest of her life with him. Now, what is interesting is that, as I said, this practice was common, you may think now of uh, Eastern, uh, pardon me, um, of countries from the Near East, Far East, etc. But this also existed in Europe and still exists here as well. Um, one example or a far-reaching example is that of Article 3, uh, 357 of the French Penal Code from 1810. This, is, this was a pretty far-reaching penal code that um, influenced many other, um, many other criminal jurisdictions, especially the jurisdictions of the French colonies. And this penal code from 1810 contained, a, one of the first, as you may think, contained a provision that if a man, so we talk about the French code, uh, contained a provision that if a man had abducted a girl and married her, he could only be prosecuted if the girl's parents or legal guardians arranged to have the marriage annulled first. So, if a man had abducted a girl and married her, he could only be prosecuted if the girl's parents or legal guardians arranged to have the marriage annulled first. Some of the parents may be even happy that the shame that was brought upon her was um, covered up by him marrying her. Although the law does not contain the word rape, it has been described as a marry rapist law and has been held responsible for spreading the phenomenon, especially in the Maghreb region, through French colonization. So the, rem the remains we have until today in those countries actually do not come from Islamic law as some may think. There are of course some influences, but they come from this actually French penal um, code. Alternatively, similar legislation was spread in the region also of the Ottoman Empire, based on a particular kind of jurisprudence, which also did not explicitly mention rape and abduction scenarios, but there's now the question or discussion among scholars, was it, um, was it um, an institute that was originally Ottoman or did, was it also influenced by, by this um, French law? As I said, this, this practice existed until very recently. And if you look at Latin American countries, where we, by the way, also until today have um, female genital mutilation in some, in some countries, I will talk about that uh, a bit later. In 1997, for example, 15 Latin American countries had laws that exonerated a rapist if he offered to marry the victim and she accepted. Those countries were, so we talk about 1997, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Panama, Peru, Paraguay, the Dominican Republic, Uruguay, and Venezuela. I already mentioned Costa Rica, where it was enough that the rapist only <coughs> offered, offered to, um, to marry the rape victim. The law in Peru was modified in 1991 to absolve all co-defendants in a gang rape case if any one of them married the victim. So in Peru it was even worse 
when there was a gang rape, it was enough when one of them offered to marry the victim. Um, now, um, I mentioned this French uh, criminal penal code, but it also exists or has existed in Italy as well. Uh, in the Codice Penale, there is article, uh, there was the article 544 of the Italian criminal code. And in this criminal code, um, this particular article considered rape con con considered rape as an as an uh, as an offense uh, against this this is the point rape was in Italy at that time an offense against public morality not against an individual person so it depended on the understanding of what public morals are and when they are violated in order to establish rape as a crime. The fact that it was done to an individual person, an individual woman, was not important in this regard. Her individuality, her sexual freedom was not taken into account. And as we talk about public morality, if the perpetrator or the morality at that time was that if the perpetrator married his victim, even if she was a minor, any sexual offense would lapse. Harassment, of course, rape, etc. Everything that has that had a sexual connotation. So neither the law nor society made a distinction between such premarital rape on the one hand and consensual elopement, which is in Sicily, where it mostly took place, was called Fritina on the other. What does that socially mean? Socially it means that the victim was put under heavy pressure to agree to marry her rapist. The alternative to that was that, he was that she was shunned down for the rest of her line as uh, what is called una donna svergognata, a woman without honor, a shameful, shameless um, woman. The victim, here again, was held responsible for the humiliation of losing her virginity, so, so again it's her fault, out of wedlock, which brought shame upon herself and her family. So again, the virginity of the girl was the symbol of the decency of the family and of the uh, value of the family. Although, once again, it was not seen as a crime against an individual person, it was also not seen, which one may think of it indirectly, as a crime against maybe family. No, it was all the time seen as a crime against public um, morality. If she agreed to marry her attacker, it was considered, a, it's called matrimonio reparatore, that's, it's, it's written, it's a rep um, reparational or rehab uh, rehabilitating marriage. So, but it was more of a reparation or rehabilitation for her, not for the perpetrator, as we may think um, in the first place. And this is something that has restored her family's honor. So, rehabilitation, reparation, not for the perpetrator, although in the end, Normatively speaking, it was so, but for her family, also not, not so much for her, but it was what she could have done to restore the honor of her family. Um, there was, um, in this regard, an interesting case, or the most important case, actually, of um, Franca Viola. It happened in 1966, and um, the case was uh, the following. Mm, she was, she had a boyfriend, and her boyfriend was a mafioso. This hap happened all in Sicily, and they were together for a very short period of time. And she decided to leave him. Then she went to Germany, came came back again to Italy, and in the meantime, she has she had found a new boyfriend. They were all minors. She was um, 15, 16 at that time, and it was it was more of a platonic relationship. So um, this boyfriend of her, the maf mafioso, um, got to know that she had a new boyfriend and raped her in 1965, hoping or counting on the thing that in order to re-establish the honor of her family, she would have then to um, marry him. But Franca did not do that. She was the first woman to refuse this reparational or rehabilitating marriage publicly. She was 17 years old when she was raped 
1965, and in the aftermath of a trial, um, the, or the, the result of all of this was that rapists were no longer able to avoid punishment through the marriage of the victims. So what happened, basically, um, she was indeed asked by her father if she wanted to marry the rapist, what the other guy was hoping for. And she said she, that she had no intention to do so. So she leaned against her family, but more also against the whole surrounding she was, she was raised in. And you have to understand in this, in, in this particular um, region, at this particular time, they have suffered many um, pressures. So it was actually the pressure from outside on her family to get her to, um, to marry her rapist. She said no. Um, he was charged and he was um, later um, convicted. The result to this was, sorry, the result to this was that some years later, only in 1981, this article was repealed. Until then, it still existed. Um, what's also interesting is that sexual violence became a crime against a person in Italy, instead a crime against public morality only in 1996. So until then, for over 30 years, the understanding of sexual offenses was as it was. Um, this is how it looked like. So on the left, you see um, Franca at that time. She was 17. And um, this is um, Melodia. This is the surname of her rapist, who, as you may see it by his gesture, does not fully grasp what he has done um, wrong. And on the right, you can see how she looks um, today. The, the issue or the case rose to attention in Italy very much because her family members were reportedly menaced, ostracized and persecuted by the townspeople. So not only was she, has she been seen as a target, but also her whole family when they decided to stand uh, beside her. For example, the vineyard and the barn, uh, the barn were torched. And these events and the eventual trial that was not expected by the perpetrators, you can see it, resonated powerfully with the Italian media and public. Um, it went so far that the parliament itself was directly involved, as it became obvious that part of the existing legal code was at odds with the public opinion, which has started to change. And it's always, as in this case, it's always obviously necessary to have one, let's call it a face or a symbol, who will initiate some changes. We know that also um, from Serbian criminal law when it comes to sexual offenses against children, for example, or now we will definitely, I'm pretty sure about that, have some developments when it comes to um, the, the, um, the, um, the regulation on firearms, etc., or the issue of guilt of children, etc. So this is this, you need a, obviously a shock moment um, to, to change things. Um, Melodias, Melodia, the surname of the guy, lawyers claimed that Viola had consented to a so-called elopement and that she had fled voluntarily to get married secretly to him, which was not true. In fact, what had happened, she has been kidnapped by him and 12 of his um, friends, um, but the trial um, found nonetheless him guilty. He was sentenced to 11 years in prison which was later reduced to 10 years. So this is something that's a problem also here in Serbia. You have one, um, one sentence and then it gets re reducted uh, after a few couple um, of years or suspended. Um, five of his friends were acquitted and the others received relatively mild sentences. Melodia was released from prison in 1976, so after, six, after, sorry, after 10 years, and was, uh, no surprise, killed uh, two years later in a mafia-style execution before he could return to Sicily. So he had a ban to return to the town where uh, he, he um, came from. After this ban elapsed, he was nonetheless killed as he still um, continued to work um, for the mafia. There, is, um, there are also various Italian movies about this issue, about this topic. There's a documentary, the movie, one of them is with Anella Muti, so if somebody wants to look it up, um, um, I can I can recommend um, that. Now, uh -huh. yeah, uh, we talked about the earlier French criminal code. We talked about this regulation in Italy, and those are all countries where you, where you would not expect those Mary rapist laws um, to exist. 
Um, where it also exists today is, for example, in Russia, when we talk about, um, when we talk about Europe. Uh, and if um, a rapist uh, hasn't done that before, if it's not a recidivist, it was, if it was his first rape, so to say, um, then he may be, um, he may be um, exonerated if he marries the victim. So it exists even there um, until today. Now, if we talk about Serbia, does this exist here as well? What do you think? A marry rapist law? Hopefully not. <laughs> Anna said probably or hopefully not. What do the others think? Now let's let's include let's include let's include all the others who are also online. The majority of you are from Serbia, so does this exist in Serbia as well? Uh, I'm not sure, but I think it existed a few years ago, and then it was um, removed from the criminal code. What do the others think? I mean, we, we probably have these practices within society in different parts of, of our country, which are like socially accepted to marry, uh, to marry a woman uh, after rape and then not to be punished for that. But I would say it, it's a social construct, probably, hopefully not in, in law today. Um, you would be surprised. Um, we do have something a norm that is regarded as a marriage rapist law and uh, it's a bit hidden but nonetheless it has the same effect and it is basically the following and this is maybe one of the most surprising things um, when you talk about um, when you talk about um, this issue uh, in the chapter 19 of criminal offenses against marriage and family, we have a crime that is called cohabitating with a minor, and uh, and um, here you can you can look it up. I will read it out. An adult cohabitating with a minor shall be punished with imprisonment of up to three years. Um, we have to say up to three years. The um, minimum time here would be thirty days, so thirty days to um, three years. If an adult cohabitates, so lives in a common law, uh, common law marriage with a minor, and the penalty, the same penalty as mentioned before, uh, shall also be imposed on a parent, adoptive parent, or guardian who makes it possible or induces a minor to cohabit with another person. So forms of complicit, comp complicity, basically. And if this offense is is um, committed for gain, so if somebody gets money. For it, the offender shall be punished with imprisonment um, from six to five years. So it's the aggravated form of this offense. However, if a marriage is concluded, prosecution shall not be undertaken. And if the prosecution is undertaken, it shall be discontinued. So this paragraph four is actually what it is, a marriage rapist law that excludes, uh, stops prosecution if those if uh, those um, adult uh, marries the uh, minor he or she mostly it's a he um, cohabitates lives lives with now when it comes to this um, to this criminal offense when you talk about minors why does this criminal offense exist it exists because there is no sufficient level of physical and psychological maturity of the minors so uh, it's not a child anymore. Yes, sure. We, we talk about a person that's over the age of 14. But nonetheless, this person, this minor, has not reached the level of maturity, nor physical, nor psychological, to understand what it means to live with somebody, uh, with somebody in a cohabitation. What's important is, here we do not talk about sexual intercourse. This is something that is... Um, regarded as an integral part of cohabitation. So it's something that is included there and doesn't have to be mentioned explicitly. Um, common law marriage as such is defined by family law in, in Serbia 
and it's defined as a more permanent cohabitation of a man and a woman. So more permanent co cohabitation of a man and a woman, because in order to um, establish this this crime, we have to uh, evaluate its sorry its elements. And first of all, common law marriage or cohabitation. What does it mean? And here we have the first problem: more permanent cohabitation. What does more permanent mean? We have. Uh, does it mean a few hours? Does it mean a few weeks? Does it mean a few a few months? It's not clear. There is a um, there is a judgment, a Serbian judgment, where it is stated that uh, the two of them were living living together only for a few hours, which was enough for the judge to establish this um, criminal offense cohabitating with a minor. So even a few hours uh, were for this judge in this particular context enough. Uh, then what is also important for this crime is the intention to live in a cohabitation and uh, also um, the age, the age as such. So we talk about persons who have, uh, who are over 14 but have not yet, um, are not yet 18 years old. What is here also interesting to see is as we have a common law marriage as a permanent, more permanent cohabitation of a man and a woman, this means that homosexual cohabitation, which also in, exists also in Serbia, is not included into this. So this falls out of the criminal scope and is not, is not a punishable behavior. And um, there are mm, tendencies to decriminalize this, um, this crime. Uh, to be honest, this is also the reason why this fourth paragraph exists. It's basically a procedural requirement for prosecution. So the prosecution, this is the formal element that is stopping, blocking the prosecution. And uh, the reason behind that is that um, for certain minorities in Serbia, it is normal that adults, adults already when they're 18 or 19, get early into marriages with mostly younger women who are 13, 12, 13, 14. Uh, and it's a cultural um, practice in their communities. And as such, th this is the reason why this fourth paragraph actually actually exists. I think there was, um, I haven't read it so far, but the book of Mirgak Maich, I think he wrote about this in, in one of his post books, Ostra if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm correct. So um, I know... He, he was the judge. In yes, exactly. He was the judge. The end, and I think he acquitted um, the, the perpetrator. So this is, this is um, if you want to read it, um, Ostra Pelikan, yes. He wrote out of his own experience as a judge, yes. Um, do you have questions? Questions so far? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, second one I've seen you have added the the um, judgment uh, with regard to opus, opus versus Turkey. Do you want to comment on that or to add anything? Um, the Mary Rep saw, by the way, well, there was an intention in Turkey to uh, introduce that a few years ago, uh, but there was such a huge public outcry that it was then stopped. But the idea is there, still there. No? Okay. No. She said no, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, let's go, let's continue. Let's continue with the, with the institutes. And let's go to uh, one very particular, very important um, article of the Istanbul Convention, which goes, which connects basically to the, to the things I've mentioned before, especially to the Mary Rapist Law. And this is Article 42. And there it stated, what are the unacceptable justifications for crimes, including crimes committed in the name of so-called honor? And um, this, is, this is very interesting because, um, first of all, that an international document uh, deals with justification grounds as such. This means that the um, creators of this document have rightfully recognized where the free space, where the open gate of, uh, gender, of criminal law, of the dogmatics is when it comes to issues of, of gender, indirectly, because the main point here is that there are bases, fundaments, on which 
illegal practices have been pardoned, explained upon. And this is something that is directly excluded by this Article 42 of the Istanbul Convention. If you look at the other relevant articles that deal with criminal law issues from the Istanbul Convention, they are defined, they are for an uh, international document, pretty uh, defined in a, in a good, precise way, but they do not usually get that much into the dogmatics as such. They leave much place to the national lawmaker to, to, add, uh, to add their to, to, to give, uh, they enable him free space to make the formulations he thinks are necessary. But here, it's very clear stated that culture, custom, religion, tradition, or so-called honor shall not be regarded as justification for such acts. This covers, in particular, claims that the victim has transgressed cultural, religious, social, or traditional norms or customs of appropriate behavior. So one Example for that was the aforementioned Mary Rapist Law. Another one will come when we we'll talk about female genital mutilation, when we talk about the special part. This article, as such, it's not intended to make the national legislator in, in, uh, implement a specific provision. It's more of a guideline, so to say, for the judges when they decide on those cases to treat them or to not treat them as justifications. Because um, when we talk about justification grounds, it's even so in Serbia, the possible catalog of justification grounds, it's not close. In Serbia, we have self-defense, we have necessity, necessity, and we have act of minor significance. Those three are formulated in the criminal code. They have certain requirements that have to be fulfilled in order to um, Establish that the that there was um, a justification ground. However, it's possible for the theory as well as for the judicial practice to develop further justification grounds. And this provision of the Istanbul Convention goes the other way around. It does not mention or it does not propose a new possible justification ground, but on the contrary, blocks some possible justification grounds, which are based on culture, custom, religion, tradition, or so-called honor, which is very, I have to say, from also from my point of view, from the dogmatics, unusual for an international law document that, first of all, again, it deals with something that belongs to the general part, but then, again, it does not um, establish something new, rather blocks something already existing, and, again, not in dogmatic terms, but oriented towards judicial practice. This is a very, very interesting um, approach. And it, I, I don't think that it was something that was expected, to be honest. Again, this is a good, uh, this is a good sign that those who have um, written the convention knew what they were writing about. Um, why, is this, why is this still an issue? unacceptable justifications for crimes, including crimes committed in the name of so-called um, honor. There is a very prominent case in um, Germany, in Berlin. This is Hatun Sugacu, and she, uh, she was a Kurdish woman from Turkey. She was born in Germany, but however, when she was, I think, 18 years old, she was married to a cousin of her and had to return to Istanbul, where she had no connections so far. There she got pregnant and they got um, a son together. And during this time where she lived in Istanbul, she wasn't allowed to work, to go out. Um, she was beaten by, uh, by her husband, etc. So everything you can imagine. And she decided, despite the pressures of her family, to return to Germany and to start a new life with her son, again in Berlin. And as you, may, as you may have seen it um, in the picture on the right, she, um, she put off her veil. Uh, she, before that, she, she was forced to wear it. She put down her veil. And she even, um, she even, she even started to work in a um, job that is not particular um, for women. She started to work on construction sites. So she was very um, determined to change her life in each and every aspect. However, uh, this also included to date um, other men, 
and also to date men that are not of Turkish origin. Uh, she had a German boyfriend and she had um, three brothers and her family. She still all the time, during all the time, all the resentments and obstacles still did not lose contact to because she loved them. Uh, knew about this or got to know about this um, German guy and they threatened they, fr they threatened her um, to, to leave him she did not um, she did not consent to and then at one night when one of her three brothers has uh, had um, visited her she went with him to the um, bus station before that they argued and he killed her he shot her and um, he was um, he was convicted to a relatively small, if we can call it like that, um, prison sentence. And there was uh, later on dispute about her son because her family, who it was, it was basically a family decision. So it was not the, the decision of one of her brothers to kill her, but it was a decision that was uh, brought upon from the whole family, although she had contacts with them all the time. And then there was... Um, there were um, legal disputes about the uh, whereabouts of, of, her, um, of her son. In the end, he was uh, put in another family. However, um, her case or her story is the one that is uh, symbolic for honor crimes, also in countries such as, as Germany. And there is a um, movie about that called No um, Frau, Just a Regular Woman, and I can, it's also something I can recommend. Um, to watch. Now this happened in 2005 and you may think that it was long ago and it's not topical anymore. However it is. Um, there is a case, very recent case from 2022, also again in, in um, Berlin, in Germany. And it was, it was the case of Mariam Ha from Afghanistan. She and her brothers came during the migration wave from 2015 to Germany. And as you have, you may see it on the picture in the middle and on the picture on the right below. She again coming to Germany has changed her lifestyle, changed the way she wanted to live, and this was something that again her brothers were against, uh, of, and uh, on the picture on the left below, you see her two brothers and a suitcase. And in this suitcase are the um, remnants of her. So they killed her and disembodied her in Berlin, put her in the suitcase and uh, went to southern Germany with her in the suitcase by train. So this, this, those are cameras from, from a hallway um, of a central station. Uh, during the whole of Germany with the suitcase <coughs> and uh, the sister in it and buried her in southern Germany. Um, this crime was relatively fast um, investigated because they were not intelligent enough to hide uh, the, 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 the traces and also there, were, um, there was this, um, there were, there's this camera footage describing what they have done to her and this uh, again raised an outcry in the German society on honor killings because it was believe that this is something that does not happen, uh, that is, uh, if it happens, it happens in, in, in rural areas, definitely not in Europe, but then again, we have two very prominent cases in such a big city as uh, Berlin one is. So um, the aforementioned Article 42 of the Convention still is relevant today and still is of particular, particular importance. This is something, those two cases, are cases we know about. There are many other cases w which we are basically not familiar with. It often happens that, especially when there are young girls or very young women, that they are sent for family vacation in their country of origin and never return. It often happens to, to um, women of Turkish or Arabic, but more Turkish um, descent in, who have been born in Germany, raised there, they have basically not much connection to their country of origin, but then have to adjust to, to the beliefs that were um, put upon them by, by their family. Do you know what was the final decision of German court on these? On the, uh, I, I don't think that they are uh, convicted. 
um, of course they're, 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 they're charged but as this is the case of 2022 I'm not sure whether they're already convicted but I can look it up for you and tell you tell you later I'm not sure because it's, it's relatively it's a relatively um, recent case um, this is this is um, a problem uh, this case was too prominent in Germany not to be not to be of course not to be prosecuted for, it will be prosecuted for sure but not to be uh, talked upon in the public because in Germany, we have um, a somehow different trend, a trend to cultural sensitivity, which means that the things I've mentioned uh, before, uh, culture, custom, religion, tradition, or so-called honor, is currently in German judicial practice treated as a, um, as, um, as a, a circumstance which leads to a milder sentence, as a mitigating circumstance. So, in order, also to be honest, it's because of the German history, the, the, the more time passes, they become more and more sensitive to the Shoah, to everything that happened. And they're in general very sensitive to issues that relate to, they do not even talk about strangers, they talk about people with migrational background. Mm -hmm. So, uh, they avoid the use of the term stranger because even that word is too stigmatizing for them. Mm -hmm. So people with a migrational background now have, I dare to say, very specific treatment in Germany. Uh, insofar as, there's, uh, as in this case, uh, this case is specific because it was, it was too, too, too harsh, but in other cases, uh, the cultural background of the person is seen as mitigating. There was a case, very prominent case, of a young student, student of medicine from Freiburg. And I mean, who has ever been to Freiburg? It's a wonderful, great city. It's like paradise on earth in Germany. Uh, the best city where, there where you can live. And everybody is nice, everybody is helpful. Uh, they're very open. And it was, uh, although one of the smallest cities in Germany, it was the city which has welcomed uh, one of the biggest um, communities of migrants. And uh, in, during this welcome culture, how is it called in Germany from 2015, there was also a, a big um, welcoming attitude and everybody was somehow involved in it, including students who helped the migrants, etc., etc. So this was in 2015. I think in 2018, one of, this is the paradox, and one of those students, a wonderful, brilliant, beautiful young lady who, who studied medicine, was found um, drowned in the small river in Freiburg, and the river is really small, I wouldn't even call it maybe a river, um, and um, she was found drowned and um, raped, and later on it came that the, um, that the perpetrator was a migrant from, Af from Afghanistan, and the only reason he was uh, traced or he was found is that he had, uh, he had colored his hair in a very particular way, and the security camera, again, security footage from, from the um, tram uh, could identify him on this particular night because Freiburg is such a small city, trams don't go everywhere and she was found really far away at that, at that um, river bet really between the bushes. And it later turned out that uh, she came back from a party. He was there at the river waiting for somebody to, to, to um, come by. She was on her bicycle and he put out his, his, um, his um, foot, his leg. He, uh, she fell down and he tried to rape her, but he couldn't. Uh, he, couldn't. Uh, he couldn't get an erection, so he raped her with his fist. And when he was done with his fist, he then... Uh, she was she she has already lost her consciousness because he choked her also, and afterwards he uh, pushed her um, her head under the water and so she drowned. Uh, later it came out that uh, she was one of the most helpful, most um, engaging students when it came to 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 helping migrants. Uh, her parents were uh, I think one, uh, were um, lawyers, very um, very prestigious, prominent people in Freiburg. But then afterwards, her parents, in order not to stigmatize other migrants or other, perp other people with a, a migration background, decided not to press additional charges. And in fact, in addition, went public saying that this is something that doesn't happen very often and that they didn't say this explicitly, but they 
the German society should forgive him, although he killed her, uh, their daughter. And they afterwards received uh, some honorary citizen prize. However, he was convicted, but to a very mild sentence. And one of the reasons why he was convicted to such a mild sentence is that he comes from such a cultural background where women basically do not value as much as men or do not value at all that he was raised in such a surrounding, although he before that already lived in a very nice family in Germany for more than three years, that he couldn't know better. And that is something that has to be taken is into account as a mitigating circumstance. Basically, this means that he was to this extent socially determined that any free will of his kind was actually neglected or relativized. And this is not the only case. It happens very often. There was also a recent case for rape, where the rapist um, received a conditional sentence. You know, he didn't even go into prison. He was he he he, he um, stayed stayed um, at liberty. So this is the, again with the same argumentation. He couldn't know it better because he does come from a different background. We have to um, accept his culture, custom, religions, tradition, etc. So this is something that um, that the German. Uh, German judicial practice formally formally recognizes. It's written in the judicial um, uh, statements. We also know that informally there's a very strong um, there's a very strong um, let's say informal way of tolerating such practices in Germany as well. I will a bit later talk about about that again. Should we make a break right yes. now? And maybe some questions. Uh, do we, yes. Do we have questions? Around. Yes, please. Do we have questions? Please, some questions. Don't be shy. Checking and I think that you have to. I, I just wanted to say yes, yes, exactly. I, I really, the break is needed after we expected more from Europe. It's, I mean, easily I come and I, I rape, I kill, and then I say, sorry, I didn't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's basically the invocation of the mistake of law. I mean, it exists as a, it exists as a criminal law institute mistake of law, pravna zabuda. Um, the point is, do we accept every mistake of law, or do we accept every invocation of mistake of law? And here, uh, um, there, there comes this division. We have uh, now. This is very, very. I speak now very dogmatically, but malum in sin, malum prohibita. In each and every society. You have, um, you have, you have, um, Anna Zgrapic is with the hand. In each and every society, you have a compromise standing on um, prohibited behavior that is, that is always a crime. Murder is always a crime. Theft is usually always a crime. Whereas rape is not always a crime, as we have seen it. Mm. And this is something, if you have such a malum in se, such an evil in itself, no invocation of the mistake of law can have effects because everybody in this society knows that this is banned behavior. No matter how much you try to invoke that as your defense, this wouldn't work. However, in this case, the German courts, not once, it, it happens all the time until today, uh, uh, has accepted those kinds of invocation. Whereas on the other side, you have something that is called mala prohibita. You have crimes that are not regarded as such, like uh, some economic crimes, um, embezzlement, etc., which are crimes, but do not harm that much. And not everybody sees them as, as, as a criminal behavior. But the first ones are the problem. Everybody knows what those crimes are. And in this particular field of those crimes, we have an overlapping between the formal criminal law norms and something that we a bit uh, try to shun away from, moral norms. So from both, from the legal aspect, from the criminal law aspect, positive law, and from the moral norms, both see, regard those um, behavior to be prohibited. And nonetheless, nonetheless, the court has taken them into, into account in this kind of way. Um, Anna Zgarkovic has raised her hand. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana. Uh, this was really uh, interesting and informative. Uh, I um, wanted to, to stress the, the fact that in some countries, for example, I'm aware of Egypt, uh, there are um, 
parts of criminal code uh, uh, explicitly stating that uh, the court are allowed to be more lenient in uh, cases of honor killings ba made by men in situations when uh, adultery is proven to be uh, true. And of course, the same uh, is not uh, al allowed um, to, to females. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's it's not. It's I mean, it's it's not the only case where 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 the female stance is uh, totally neglected. I mean, we have it. You have it in other legal jurisdictions as well. But I will not go too much into that. But thank thank you for the remark. Thank you. Um, I will come to Egypt later on in the context of female genital mutilation because more than ninety five percent of women in Egypt are um, genitally mutilated. So basically every woman in Egypt, and it's, 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 it's incredible, but I will talk about that later. Thank you. Thank you for the remark. 15 minutes. Ah, now we have a break of 15 minutes. <laughs> 